Welcome to Advice for Grad Students. I'm Phil Hahn, your host, and I'm joined uh, or joined with me today is Kelly Greenhill, who's Associate Professor of Political Science at Tufts University and a fellow alum. Kelly, welcome to Advice for Grad Students, and I want to turn it right over to you. Uh, after I say that the views expressed here are our own and don't necessarily represent those of our host institutions. So Kelly, what do you have? What advice do you have for the grad students when it comes to field work? So thank you first, uh, Phil, for uh, having me join you. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> oh, Jesus. In terms of uh, advice for graduate students on field work, don't do your field work if you're sick. Um, so uh, field work is, is worth spending just a couple of uh, minutes talking about what we mean by field works quite often conventionally. We think of field work as um, uh, graduate students or faculty going out um, into the field to do ethnographic research with, uh, with research subjects. It's worth noting that a more expansive definition of fieldwork might be worth employing. And we think about fieldwork as any kind of embedded research, you know, outside of one's uh, home environment. And that can include spending time uh, in government documents, uh, repositories, you know, in archives, as well as traditional ethnographic research with cohorts, uh, conducting interviews with uh, elites and with people you know, on the ground. Uh, so when I say ethnographic research, that can also obviously entail interviews, but it can be observational um, research, you know, watching uh, various groups in action. And of course, there's also um, quite important the gathering of data through the use of surveys and uh, field experiments. So all of those, you know, to my mind, constitute uh, varieties of field work. Uh, in terms of advice I would offer, <laughs> with regard uh, to fieldwork, I would say um, uh, several things. Uh, first of all, uh, it's worth having a well-developed plan when going into the field, uh, have one's research de de design well uh, underway um, to make sure that one has undertaken all of the necessary steps uh, required in order to get uh, internal uh, institutional review board uh, sign off on <coughs> on one's research, assuming there are human subjects involved before going into the field. Uh, so do as much prep as possible and get all of the I's dotted and T's crossed before uh, planning to go into the field and before embarking um, on one's field work. One should also reach out to potential interview subjects, uh, to folks one intends to talk with or interact with at least a month, to possibly two months in advance of the time one plans to go into the field. This can also hold uh, if one is planning to do field work by uh, going into the archives, uh, into do document repositories, interacting with archivists in uh, libraries to find out uh, what finding aids are available. These are uh, these finding aids are not necessarily available online. What other kind of uh, resources might be available in archives that are not self-evident uh, before one arrives, as well as finding out from archivists whether some uh, set of documents are not going to be available uh, for one or another reasons at the time one is planning to undertake one's, one's field research. In other words, you know, in a quick and dirty way, do as much prep work uh, as possible in advance. Now here comes the, the wrinkle is that uh, once one arrives, one should anticipate that the first, um, like the first battle plan doesn't survive contact with the enemy. The plan that one has for, for field work will probably not survive first contact with one's um, uh, research subjects. And so not, you know, not because of malfeasance by, by anyone or uh, people acting in bad faith, but simply people's schedules changed, data that one thinks is going to be available is often unavailable. Um, life intervenes when it shows up in the archives and uh, goes into folders and finds that all of the documents are still fully redacted or classified. Uh, so part of the prep uh, that I didn't yet talk about is that one should have a plan B and a plan C 
for how you know how to pivot and uh, take advantage of um, the unexpected. And what if one finds out that one's original plans for field <laughs> work don't come to fruition? And uh, I can say you know, on the upside that many of the happy surprises, which you know started off as unfortunate uh ohs, um, have you know given rise to still better research projects or not or you know, follow on research projects that I hadn't anticipated when going into the field. And I that's true for work I've done in the archives. It's true for observational work I've done um, in you know countries far far flung countries. And it's been true of um, survey research that I've conducted in the field. Uh, sometimes on my own and sometimes with the help of major uh, international organizations such as the World Bank. So be prepared to pivot, have a plan, plan B and a plan C. Um, there's almost always something interesting that comes out of field work. Let's say a couple, <coughs> excuse me, other things are, um, if at all possible, plan to travel to the same location twice. Uh, it's not always necessary, but sometimes it takes a while to get people to agree to agree to interviews. Once they've met you, become comfortable with you, they're often willing to have follow-on interviews. And sometimes those follow-on interviews can happen remotely, but having the opportunity to come back and re-engage with people can be invaluable. Um, and with regard to survey research, sometimes one figures out after one's fielded one's first survey that didn't actually ask the right questions or there are additional questions that they're asking. So to the extent that it's feasible and possible to get funding um, and to return to the field or to return to a new study site that can be um, invaluable. Stop there for a minute <laughs> to cough and see if you have another question. Sorry. Well, can, can you talk a little bit about um, the IRB process, which seems to over the years have grown and grown, about how much time and resources to invest in that on the front end? So I would say uh, it, it will vary. Uh, uh, unsurprisingly, will vary radically across projects, uh, the study site, the nature of the research that one plans to undertake. But I can say from my own personal experience that I've had IRB experiences that have been as simple as you, know, you submitted this for full um full consideration, but actually we think it's exempt. And so it's a quick and dirty, easy, easier than anticipated situation. Um, and I've all, uh, as opposed to other, uh, other projects where it's taken well over a year to get a survey uh, approved. And in the, and the ultimate product was very successful and, and I understand well why the IRB was as meticulous uh, and deliberative as they were, but um, one should anticipate that it can take quite a bit of time. An additional piece of the puzzle is that uh, if one is conducting <laughs> survey research in, <coughs> excuse me, in a foreign country, one also needs to leave time to do the translation of the survey as well as the back translation of the survey just to make sure that nothing was, if you will, lost in translation. And one wants to make sure that one is in fact asking the questions um, and soliciting the answers that one is intending to and that you know nothing has um, become tweaked in an unfortunate way in the process of translation and back translation. Um, it's also <laughs> worth noting that in addition to there being tremendous variability associated with uh, the type of project, the nature of the project and the study site, there can also be tremendous variability across schools. And um, it's hard to plan for that, but any given, you know, grad students can solicit advice from more senior folks inside their institution, and maybe also folks inside the institutions if this is a collaborative effort to get a sense ahead of time of what does IRB look like inside your institution. It's not foolproof, but uh, yeah. information is power and it's worth gathering as much information in advance of going through the process as possible. I should also note that that quite often, you know, I, you know, the IRB, I didn't say quite often, as a rule, IRB folks are, are um, dedicated professionals and they wanna do right by their subjects. So they're not putting arbitrary, um, barriers in the way of researchers, they, they want to safeguard subjects. So sometimes it's worth having discussions with members of the IRB or IRB staff before submitting um, applications 
not all institutions allow for that, but some do. So one can uh, get more and often quite valuable information in advance of, um, of submitting. Okay. So we only have a couple of minutes left. I want to get into some war stories. So can you tell me something that you did that was in the field that worked out really well and contrast that with your one of your biggest mistakes that uh, you would want to leave to grad students, just the variability of what can happen in the field? So I'm actually going to... Uh... <laughs> As academics often do, I'm going to answer a slightly different question than the one you posed. Okay. Uh, but uh, say war stories, uh, keeping that in mind, in addition to some of the other uh, obstacles that can um, end up in one's way, one can sometimes confront off very <laughs> material obstacles, as in you can't get to your study site. So while uh, doing field work on the ground in the Balkans, uh, my transportation actually hit a mine. And uh, I couldn't get to the place. The, the, the RUNV truck um, was disabled uh, twice. And so <laughs> unable to get where I needed to go. Um, that's, I hope, an unusual sort of thing. But, but I think figuratively or metaphorically, one can hit all sorts of mines. And the, so uh, it's a different way of imagining that um, problems can arise and there can be um, and any uh, an additional series of reasons why people might need to pivot. Uh, in terms of, I wouldn't say it was a mistake, but in terms of caveat emptor or things that um, that researchers need to keep in mind, graduate students or otherwise, when interacting with uh, folks in the field, unsurprisingly, quite often, uh, folk, people will tell a researcher what they think the researcher wants to hear. And it is not unusual to uh, be interviewing subjects whose stories change appreciably over the, over the course of a single interview in ways that um, can't simply be tied to there being difficulties in translation or um, misunderstandings, but the stories actually change and, and um, facts change. And, uh, histories change and they can change in part because interview subjects think that they can get something out of the interviewer. Sometimes if one is interacting with, uh, with groups, they think that the researcher can get them out of the country or get them something that they need. And so the stories will evolve in line with what um, they need or what they think the researcher can get them. Uh, that's unsurprising. It's, you know, it's just a fact of life. Uh, and vulnerable populations have reasons to have a flexible relationship with the truth sometimes, but, but it's worth keeping that in mind. Um, even in, in situations where nobody's in danger or nobody's in need of things, you know, people's recollections can um, be imperfect uh, in the rear view mirror and um, people recounting their own role in historical events can be tinged by willful self-deception, by rose-colored glasses and all those sorts of things. Now, you know, nothing I'm saying here is going to be a surprise to anybody who's done research, but it's nevertheless worth remembering um, that human subjects research is as vulnerable to um, data quality issues as any other kind of data. Okay, well, great. Well, fantastic interview. I'd love to go on all day on this subject, but that's all the time we have. Thank you very much, Kelly, for being with us today on Advice for Grad Students.